Okay, so um, transport infrastructure is one of the key elements in achieving a balanced growth within our economy. When we have a well-functioning transport infrastructure and an efficient uh, infrastructure, it's easier uh, to move our goods and services within and outside our country. And uh, uh, once uh, that is done, that would facilitate trade and tourism. And uh, in a way, we are linking smaller markets to bigger markets. Um, less developed economy to more developed economies and that would also allow for the exchange of knowledge and technology and also promote um, innovation in in several economies next slide please now since uh we all know that the philippines is an archipelagic country so the water transport sector takes on a much larger role in our economy according to the latest data of the philippine statistics authority almost 100% of our goods are being traded via water. So this highlights the importance of the water uh, transport sector such that the performance of this sector would greatly affect the performance of our whole economy. Next slide, please. So today we will zoom in on our seaports since this is the main infrastructure in the water transport sector. Now, uh, seaports, if it, you you would like to look at the literature, it's considered as an economic catalyst or it promotes uh, economic activities, not only in the area where they are located and also in uh, areas located near the ports. Next slide, please. So these are just uh, some of the few uh, things that you will find in the literature on the contribution of ports to economic development. Um, Ports offer the cheapest way of transportation, the water uh, water transfer. It's uh, it uses uh, less um, energy as compared to uh, energy and investment as compared to road, railways. It, it's usually a convenient location for import and export activities because of cost considerations and it acts as assembly points for uh, many manufacturing and agricultural activities because uh, of its linkages to other transport uh, transportation system, also port operation creates um, opportunities for the population. So, next slide, please. So today we are looking at the state of our water transport infrastructure in the Philippines, and uh, uh, we did this by looking at statistics, looking at comparative um, assay and statistics, and uh, previous studies. We also checked at the uh, government plans through the Philippine development plans, medium term development plans to see exactly where we are, uh, what are the plans of the government, and uh, to come up with an updating find, updated findings on the Philippine transport uh, sector. Next slide, please. So to start the presentation, let us uh, first look at how important the water transport sector is. Next slide, please. Now, as mentioned uh, earlier, Water is heavily utilized as the primary mode of transfer for our domestic products. So almost 100% it goes through uh, the water. Next slide, please. Okay, the top three traded commodities via water are machinery, transport equipment, our food, live animals, and manufactured goods. So we exchange it, uh, uh, inter-island exchange of uh, trade. Next slide, please. Now, there are regions in the countries uh, that have higher uh, water trade activities than others. These are the Central Visayas, uh, the Northern Mindanao, the NCR, and the Central Luzon. Next slide, please. And uh, we also utilize um, our water infrastructure for uh, inter-island uh, travel. So in uh, 2018, there was a, a total of 76 million domestic passengers, and a lot of our domestic passengers are actually from the Visayas region. So 50% of so Visayas, uh, the biggest uh, percentage is from Central Visayas, 25%. Western Visayas, 15%, and Eastern Visayas, 10%. So probably because uh, water transfer is the cheapest and more, most affordable uh, means of going from one island to another. Next slide, please. So the next question is, how many seaports do we have in the Philippines? Next slide. 
So over the years, the number of seaports have increased. Uh, in 1994, we had a total of 1,312 uh, seaports. Uh, 1,230 of these are operational. By 1999, we had an additional 200 plus uh, seaports. So the total went up to 1,500. And uh, in 2015, uh, this data is sourced from the census. Um, the total number of operational seaports is uh, 1,886. So as you can see from the figure on the right side, um, we have seaports all over the Philippines. And uh, just to give you an idea of how numerous uh, our seaports are, you, the total number of seaports in the country is around 1,800. Uh, the total number of municipalities in the Philippines is uh, around 1,500 long. Um, we have around 7,000 plus islands. Uh, only 2,000 of those are inhabited. So we, we do have a lot of uh, seaports in our country. Next slide, please. Now, um, before we talk about the state of our water transport infrastructure, I think it's important that we understand the, the structure of, um, of how seaports are operated and managed. So uh, we have four four groups that manage our seaports. Uh, the main government agency in this uh, um, sector is the Philippine Ports Authority, which is um, the PPA um, takes care of the planning and development of seaports in the country. Then we have the independent port authority. These are created to decentralize power from the PPA and also to allow LGUs to take care of their own ports. So under the IPA, you have the uh, Cebu Ports Authority, Cebu uh, Ports Authority, etc. Um, the DOTR naman, uh, the DOTR takes care of the fishing, fishing and feeder ports. Um, and then we have the last group is the those ports under the roll on roll of transport system. So um, these are the Roro ports, LGU uh, Roro terminal. So which the the Roro terminal system uh, aims to connect yung ating uh, sea ports and the uh, um, road highway uh, to have a seamless travel between uh, from ano, from Luzon to Visayas and Mindanao. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, how are we utilizing our ports? Next slide, please. So over the years, um, we have seen an increase in the total cargo throughput. So a general increase, but as we can see from this figure, um, foreign foreign cargo throughput um, dominates uh, our know, our ports. Uh, it's uh, the foreign the volume of foreign cargo is higher than the domestic cargo throughput. Next slide, please. So import activities in our ports uh, have also uh, increased over the years, but our exports has decreased since 2014. Next slide, please. Now there are um, more important ports or more busier ports than others. Um, a lot of our exports uh, go through Luzon. So 81% of our exports are uh, processed in Luzon. Um, nineteen percent of this goes to the Manila International Container Ports. So other important ports uh, in the Luzon area are the Manila South Harbor, the Subic uh, Area Free Port, and the Clark uh, Special Economic Zone in Pampanga. So in Visayas, the important uh, port when talking about uh, Philippine exports is the Cebu City uh, Port, and in Mindanao, uh, the one in Davao City. Next slide, please. Uh, a similar picture can be um, observed for our import activities. So uh, similarly, our import, a lot of our imports are being processed in the Manila International Container Ports, uh, which holds around, uh, which uh, process, uh, receives around 30% of our imports. Um, Manila South Harbor, so big area, and Clark Airways are also important gateways for our imports. Uh, in the Visayas, uh, Cebu City pa rin, and in Mindanao, Davao City is an important um, gateway for our imports. Next slide, please. 
Now, port utilization has also increased over the years because um, passenger uh, traffic was also increasing. Um, so inter-island travel is gaining ground, it's becoming more popular. So our ports are, are, are seeing an influx of passengers. Next slide, please. Now, um, this increase in passenger and domestic cargo is uh, also complemented by an increase in the number of domestic ports. Uh, the, the blue line on both graphs, you know, uh, that's uh, the number of domestic ports over time. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, as important as looking at our domestic utilization of ports, it's also important to compare uh, some qualities of our ports, uh, some statistics of our ports with other ASEAN countries to see um, where we stand up. So next slide, please. Now, um, Based on this figure, so the Philippines is the one uh, na, uh, uh, coded uh, yellow-green. Based on this figure, we have uh, uh, an, a quite a number of uh, international seaports. And, and compared to other ASEAN countries, uh, sobrang dami siya, uh, similar with Indonesia. And uh, the reason for this is uh, probably because both our countries are ano, uh, archipelagos. So we really need uh, more seaports. But uh, next slide, please. But despite having more uh, international seaports, um, unfortunately, we are trailing behind other ASEAN countries in terms of vo volume of international cargo and or also international shipping containers. So um, international sea cargo throughput is high in Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, um, sea container throughput is also high in Malaysia and in Singapore, despite them uh, having a um, smaller number of international um, ports. But, um, well, definitely there are a lot of um, factors affecting the direction of trade, but um, you know, um, this just indicates that um, having more international seaports is not enough to attract maritime trade. So next slide, please. Now, this table shows us um, some performance indicators for the ASEAN countries. And uh, uh, from this table, we can see that uh, the um, ports of uh, Malaysia and Singapore can accommodate larger uh, vessels. So maximum size of vessels, average size of vessels uh, is definitely higher than other ASEAN countries. Um, the ports of Singapore and Thailand are also are more efficient uh, because uh, the time spent in ports is only just 0.7 days. Um, the Philippines naman is uh, the performance uh, in this aspect is not so bad because one, one day um, it's, it, it fares better than uh, Myanmar, for instance, or ano, Indonesia. But uh, generally, the our ports, pardon, there's an indication that our ports uh, can accommodate smaller vessels. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, when it comes to the quality of our ports, uh, the perception is generally uh, quite low. Okay, so uh, this... Uh, figure shows the quality of ports ranking for the ASEAN 6, and uh, we find ourselves in the bottom. Um, the, this was a survey for business executives, and they were asked like how on their perception on the quality of infrastructure and the quality of port services. And uh, yon, um, as compared with other um, ASEAN countries, uh, the Philippines is... Uh, the quality of our ports is uh, quite uh, inferior to others. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of port connectivity to global liner shipping network, which is uh, very important uh, to benefit fully from maritime trade, international maritime trade, um, our liner shipping connectivity is also very low. We are near the bottom. So th this is an index. Um, the higher, the better. 
um, we can see that uh, Singapore and Malaysia has a uh, has received very high index for connectivity. But the Philippines, which is in yellow green, color red, yellow green, um, we are near the bottom. So the, there's definitely uh, a huge room for improvement if we want to maximize our our um, chances at uh, um, gaining more from international trade. Next slide, please. Now, there have been a lot of studies uh, that were written on the Philippine water transport sector. And in this section, uh, we summarize the findings because a lot of the findings, a lot of the issues and challenges that uh, previous studies um, uh, um, written um, are still uh, constraining the performance of the sector until now. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, first, uh, is that our seaports are mostly underdeveloped and they have inadequate um, equipment. So um, in 2009, uh, the World Bank released a report um, stating that the quantity of our seaport infrastructure fares well with other countries. Uh, so we have also seen in uh, the statistics earlier. However, the quality, capacity, and service delivery uh, need much improvement and the this this problem actually is not unique for the Philippines. Um, there, there's this study that's saying that um, actually in Asia, uh, infrastructure development is really more focused on the quantity rather than quality. However, it is the quality that has better impact on the economic growth because it improves the productivity and efficiency of the population and the main economic activities in the country. Now. Um, Dr. Gilbert Danto in his study um, was explaining that um, the Philippine government is financially constrained and um, it cannot, uh, the way for it to, uh, to address uh, the increasing demand for infrastructure uh, needs of the population is really to turn to the private sector for support, so the um, private partnership. But um, this, public, this Korean publication was saying that the Philippines um, continues to lag other um, other ASEAN countries in terms of port development because um, they they listed a lot of characteristics like in terms of uh, number of ports, in terms of um, capacity of our ports, in terms of um, trains. Um, our ports are really inferior to that of Malaysia, Singapore, Korea, and even Indonesia. Okay, next slide, please. Now, um, the study, uh, okay, so there was this um, interviews that were conducted uh, in preparation for the Philippine Multimodal Transportation and Logistic Industry Roadmap by the UP Institute for Development Econometric Analysis. And there is uh, a common sentiment of the respondents there is that government operated seaports outside of Metro Manila uh, really need major updates. Uh, they usually lack cargo handling equipment uh, needed for an efficient supply chain. And uh, Marina also released a report in 2016 uh, citing limited cargo base and inadequate port infrastructure as, infrastructure as part of uh, the factors affecting high logistic costs in the country. Um, similar to this, another paper which was released by Arancada by Ho, uh, and uh, co-authors um, listed the absence of uh, proper port infrastructure as one of the reasons for the high export cost in the Philippines. And they explain that uh, regional ports usually don't have uh, the proper infrastructure, uh, the, the trains. So um, when when exporters need this uh, infrastructure, they, they still need to hire a ship with a train so they can transfer their uh, um, export, so which drives the export cost uh, upwards. Okay, next slide, please. Now, another uh, problem with our ports is congestion. Um, in 2019, the World Shipping Council lists Manila as one of the top 50 busiest uh, ports in the world, and congestion remains a problem in Metro Manila. So, um, a lot of shippers, a lot of um, exporters and importers. Uh, still 
chooses uh, Manila over other ports. So there's an imbalance in the usage of ports, uh, probably be also because of the capability and capacity and also um, the availability of um, other services needed by uh, by the exporters. Um, so there's there's an imbalance in the usage of our ports that some some of our ports uh, are facing congestion while some ports are um, underutilized. So the increasing cargo and passenger traffic in the greater capital region is further straining the already congested port of Manila, and it it's also affecting the road networks nearby. So this is a big problem in Manila. Um, the paper of Dr. Pataling Pug and the co-authors also added that um, mismanagement of shipping containers is also um, exacerbating the congestion problem in Manila. So there, there have been government initiatives to address um, cargo traffic situation in the port of Manila. So the government uh, tried to develop the Batangas port and the Subic ports uh, just to augment this um, demand for, you know, for cargo and passenger. Um, but a majority of shippers, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, and shipping lines still prefer to use the Manila port because of the reliable shipping schedule and efficient cargo processes so uh, there's still a uh, no uh, there's still a lot to do in the batangas and subic ports uh, for for us to be able to convince the shippers to transfer plus um the distance of these ports add uh, act as disincentives for the users next slide please Okay, so number three problem. Um, I think there's a consensus in in previous studies that uh, the conflicting role of government agencies in the water transport sector um, is unfavorable for the growth of the sector. So uh, when ports authority act as operator, developer, and regulator at the same time, pairing up. Um, as the World Bank um, phrased it, there's a need to provide checks against the influence of operational interest in the formulation of policy and regulation. Um, one example of a conflict of interest is that a porch authority usually they gain from, um, they get a percentage from uh, the profit of um, port operators. So therefore, um, uh, when when these port operators applies for an increase in uh, in the fees, it usually gets approved, which is of course um, to the disadvantage of the users. Um, so um, a lot of studies actually uh, recommended to revisit the functions granted to port authority. Uh, these are some of the recommendations to give the development and operation functions to the private sector because those are the strengths of the private sector anyway um turn over the development of less economically viable ports on lgu land to the lgus next slide please um one study said that uh, maybe we should establish a separate entity to regulate ports and uh, another study um recommended to lease port facilities instead of collecting fees so that terminal operators uh, would uh, compete and then uh, this would encourage them to improve their port services. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the, the last uh, uh, of, of the issues that we listed is the lack of nationwide coordination in port planning. Um, actually, this is, a main this is a main challenge for the the, the whole um, transport sector in the Philippines. Uh, there's no institutional anchoring for overall integrated planning. Um, so therefore, this creates inefficiency in our uh, network, transportation network, as well as uh, there's an imbalance of investment. Um, of course, we do have a lot of port, port development bodies that manages our ports, but they operate in isolation. They don't really uh, coordinate with each other. Um, related to this, there's also a need to strengthen our data reporting because that would be very useful for an effective national uh, planning for our um, transportation system. Next slide, please. 
So what have we done in the past 10 years? Why are we here? Why, why is the state of our uh, transport infrastructure like this? Next slide, please. Actually, infrastructure investment was not really a priority of our government for the for many years. Um, there's a World Bank publication that recommended that for developing countries, uh, we should allot at least 4.5% of our GDP to infrastructure investment. But for the Philippines, uh, for many years, it has been around 2 to 3% long. Next slide, please. Okay, so so this um, table is uh, a very short summary of uh, what we found from the Philippine development uh, plans and medium term development plans, following what Dr. Gilbert uh, Lianto done in two thousand in his two thousand and four book. So as we can see from late nineteen seventies to early nineties, the government was really focused on expanding our uh, transportation network. So it was about construction of regional seaports, national seaports, trunk lines, uh, linkages connecting the seaports, um, development of fishing ports, development of feeder ports. But uh, around uh, the 90s, when the Philippines experienced uh, economic crisis, uh, the government chose to uh, maintenance activities over building uh, new infrastructure. And then in early 2000, around 2003, the government started developing the role on uh, role of network. So that was the focus, rehabilitation of uh, ports that were later converted into Roro ports, and then the expansion of Roro ports. So um, just recently, um, this is what we found in the 2017-2022 Philippine Development Plan. Uh, it, there was already a, a recognition of the problems in in the water transport sector that uh, uh, it was mentioned that yes the demand was increasing and uh, we are facing congestion in our major ports and therefore uh, there is a need to decongest this uh, these ports and therefore we need to improve our uh, port facilities in uh, other parts of uh, the philippines so the it's easier to decongest uh, our main ports. Next slide, please. So here are some important policy developments. In next slide, please. In the updated uh, Philippine Development Plan, uh, there there are these three targets: the enactment of the national transport policy, um, the NEDA crafted the national transport policy, uh, which seeks to improve the efficiency and improve the coordination and planning of our uh, transport system. So uh, part of the, uh, the MPP is actually to establish independent regulatory bodies for railway and maritime transport sectors and uh, enact a law establishing an independent body for uh, transport safety and security. So next slide, please. Um, there are related bills for this legislative agenda. So for the enactment of the NPP, there are two House bills, House Bills 2222 and 315, but both are still pending with the Committee on Transportation since 2013. So while waiting for that, the NEDA board adopted the NPP on September 2017 and uh, um, natapos natan nila yung IRR, which was approved in December 2018. And then the enactment of law establishing an independent regulatory bodies for the railway and maritime transport. Uh, there's this bill, uh, the Philippine Ports Corporation Act, that aims to separate the regulatory and commercial function of the Philippine Ports Authority by creating a separate agency called uh, the Phil Ports. The field ports will retain the development and management function of the PPA while regulatory function of PPA shall be transferred to Marina. Um, this was already filed in 2019 and still pending with the Committee of Government Reorganization. Lastly, for the enactment of the establishing independent body for transport safety and security, uh, Senate Bill 1077 uh, aims to create a national transport safety board. Um, the, the, the bills has been passed in June 2022 and also pending for a bicameral conference. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so to summarize everything that uh, I, I presented uh, today, next slide please. Uh, well, I think we have established that water transport infrastructure has an undeniably crucial role in facilitating a balanced growth within our economy. But as shown uh, by the data and discussed in previous studies, most ports in our country are small. They have insufficient equipment and facilities. We have a problem uh, with the imbalance of usage of our ports, which is partly driven by the unevenness in the capacity and capability of our ports. Uh, the conflicting roles of government agencies and the lack of coordination in port planning have contributed to the low quality of services and inefficient functioning of our ports. Next slide, please. And uh, historically, little attention has been given to providing a con uh, conducive institutional environment to allow our ports to compete and operate efficiently. Um, the main uh, recommendation of the paper is actually to pass the urgent, there is an urgent need to pass the law adapting the national transport policy to ensure coordinated planning and efficient functioning of the whole transport system because we think that this is a very huge step to solving many of the problems of the water transport sector. So let's start with the NTP and move from there. Okay, so um, my presentation ends here. Thank you so much for lending me your ears.